so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's New Year's Eve, 1963. And a party is underway at the home of CSIRO photographer Ken Nash and his wife Ruth in Chatswood, Sydney. It's a formal affair. Suits and ties, pretty frocks, name tags, a piano tinkering away in the background. His colleague, physicist Dr Gilbert Bogle, is in a corner chatting to Mrs Margaret Chandler. They're both married to other people, but they can't stay away from each other sharing kisses away from the prying eyes of the party. Geoffrey, Margaret's husband, is well aware of their attraction. He doesn't mind at all. In fact, he finds the party so pretentious and stifling, he chooses to leave her to it and heads off at about midnight to see one of the women he's seeing on the side. At 4am, Dr Bogle and Mrs Chandler leave the Chatswood party together and drive towards Lane Cove River. They're headed for a well-known spot on the riverbank called Lover's Lane. But something happens in the early hours of New Year's Day, and the bodies of the pair are discovered once the sun has risen, half-naked and arranged bizarrely a few metres apart. Their deaths quickly become front-page news, and their cause of death is debated and pondered over for decades as police hunt an unknown killer. But there's more to this story, the truth of which doesn't start to unravel until long after the damage has already been done. I'm Gemma Bath and this is True Crime Conversations a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Today's episode is about one of Sydney's most mysterious double homicides. Helping me discuss the case is documentary filmmaker, podcaster and author Peter Bart. In 2006, Peter released a documentary called Who Killed Dr Bogle and Mrs Chandler, which he's since turned into a book as well as a podcast. Peter, I want to start with the Lane Cove River in Sydney. For those who haven't been there, don't know what it's about, what is it like there? Is it a a highly populated area? No, it's sort of a a reserved bushland river. It starts in the North Shore and flows down to Parramatta River. A lot of it's designated bushland. And back in the 1960s, It was very much bushland with a small strip of houses outside of the National Park. There was a National Park on the northern side. On the southern side is pure bushland and picturesque, most beautiful river you could imagine in Sydney. Really? Mm. So is it a picnic spot, a place where people want to come swim? Yes. Well, it used to be way back in the uh, turn of the century. It was a favourite place for people to go in rowboats up the river, have picnics, pick wildflowers. Then it started to get a little bit messy. Uh, (laughs) By messy, (laughs) what do you mean? (laughs) Well, industry started to... So pollution. Pollution, yeah, yeah, to encroach on the river. So they built a weir halfway up Mm -hmm. and after the weir, it became a national park, designated national park. But the rest of the river was kind of left to its own. And down the side of the river near Fuller's Bridge, if anyone knows Fuller's Bridge, it's right near the weir, was a lover's lane. Now, lover's lane is where this story starts, really. And we're going to start there on New Year's Day, 1963. Can you, in your own words, talk us through what was discovered there that morning? Okay. A couple of boys in their early teens were walking down a bush track along the side of the river to a golf course to collect golf balls. On the way, they saw a man covered in a suit laying down near the bank of the river. They just thought he was a drunk and they walked on. About an hour and a half later, they came back from collecting the golf balls and they noticed that the man's face had turned purple and uh, they thought maybe he's dead. So they went to the National Park kiosk, raised the alarm, the police turned up and sure enough, this man was dead. When you say covered in a suit, 
he wasn't wearing it, was he? No, the police thought he was uh, wearing the suit. Yeah. But they then quickly realised that his coat was just laying over the top of him. His pants were laying over the top of his lower half. It looked like he was wearing a suit, but he was actually half naked from the waist down. And uh, that was very strange. Hmm. And then they made another discovery a few metres away from him. Yeah, about 17 metres along on the bed of the river itself, Mm -hmm. they found basically uh, opened out cardboard. And underneath that cardboard was a woman who was also half naked from the waist up. She was in a party dress. That dress was all muddy and in disarray. So they basically had two bodies. That had been kind of partially or strangely covered. Strangely covered, yes. That was the weird thing. Straight away you've got, well, what's killed them and who's covered them? Well, from the moment they were found, this case was considered bizarre, wasn't it? Absolutely bizarre. These two people were kind of respectable people that you wouldn't imagine they'd be in a very sort of muddy Lover's Lane. Uh, Well, Lover's Lane itself was a a bush track, but the bed of the river where their underwear, a belt and shoes were found was obviously where these two people had gone down for privacy. They'd half undressed in the process of making love and something happened. So there was very strange circumstance that the police normally didn't come across. Mm. They'd go to situations where there'd been stabbings or shootings. But this one, there was no evidence whatsoever on the bodies as to what killed them. And then initially, when they went and did an autopsy, was there anything in that particular first step that told them what had killed them? No, absolutely none. They either stopped breathing or their heart stopped. But there was nothing identifiable at the autopsy. So the organs were sent to the chief toxicologist in town and uh, it was his job to analyse the tissue samples and the blood, looking for what killed them. Let's start with the female victim. Her name was Margaret Chandler. Who was she? Margaret Chandler was married to Geoffrey Chandler, who was an electronics engineer working for the CSIRO. His laboratory was based in Sydney University and he was uh, a rather outgoing chap who believed in extramarital affairs and he had encouraged his wife to do the same. When you say encouraged, I think the way it's described is, you know, an open marriage. Yes, that's right. It was a very unusual thing in those days. Because it's it was, the 60s. So. In early 60s, late, I mean, it was basically at the end of the 50s. True. It was still a very conservative society. 70 to 80% of people went to church here on a Sunday. You couldn't get a hotel room if you weren't married. People just didn't carry on this way. <laughs> so what do we know about the male victim, Dr. Gilbert Bogle? Dr. Bogle was a physicist, also working for the CSIRO along with Jeffrey Chandler, Mm. the husband of Mrs. Chandler. He was a brilliant scientist, very much respected in the CSIRO and around the world. He was just about to leave Australia to go and live in America, work in America for Bell Laboratories, which was a major defence and communications company in America. So CSIRO, we've got that on both sides. Is that how they met? Yeah, that's how they met. In fact, Dr. Bogle and Mrs. Chandler had only met once before. They'd met at a CSIRO Christmas party 12 days earlier. The next time they met was New Year's Eve at a party in Chatswood, Sydney. A very sedate, select group of people, about 20 of them, Mm -hmm. men in suits and ties, ladies in lame dresses. And it was not the sort of wild, raging party that we have today. (laughs) It was totally refined. very much refined and almost, you'd say, conservative. Right. The Chandlers were only invited because Dr. Bogle had expressed interest in inviting them to the party. He'd met Mrs. Chandler at the CSIRO Christmas party. They got to know each other a little bit. And Dr. Bogle said to the hosts, Ken and Ruth Nash, why don't you invite them along to your annual party? And so they turned up. Jeffrey turned up in an Hawaiian shirt and, oh. and, and slacks and sandals. So they were kind of fish out of the water. Uh, gotcha. uh, Mrs. Chandler was beautifully dressed in a rose pattern dress. She sort of fitted in and she was kind of young and beautiful. And Dr. Bogle was there and they, you know, spoke a lot during the night. 
We're even seen having a little bit of a, a hug and kiss out in the backyard. <laughs> okay, so we know that Margaret, Mrs Chandler, was in an open relationship. What about Dr Bogle? Dr Bogle was a family man. Mm-hmm. He had four children. The Chandlers had two young children. It was unknown about his background, mm-hmm. uh, his relationships, if he had relationships, until certain people came forward to suggest that Dr Bogle had had affairs. Right. And, I mean, we've alluded to it, but these two were in a bit of a, not relationship, but they were having a little bit of a sexual fling, so to speak. Or, that, that's right, yeah. yes. And it was their first time alone together. They left the party at four o'clock mm-hmm. in the morning. They drove down to the Lanco River and that was their demise. Mm. News of their deaths broke around midday the following day on New Year's Day. How did the media react to this news? Well, and on a slow news day, uh, <laughs> it, was day. The big st- it was the big story of the day yeah. and it was the big story of the year and for years to come because the mystery of mm. how did these two people die the journalists turned up and they couldn't believe what had landed on their desk in a sense. <laughs> they had a story that had adulterous relationships, well-respected people, scientists, and a kind of libertarian aspect to this story. Now, Sydney was, as I said, was conservative, but there was a libertarian group called The Push. People involved were like Jermaine Greer yep. and others who saw the world in a different way. They believed in free love. That wasn't really the centre of the thing, but they believed in drinking as well. They believed in a good time. And they were a little bit out there. And Jeffrey Chandler was part of that world. In fact, Jermaine Greer used to turn up at the Chandler's home for parties. So <laughs> they were just a select milieu of people who were living like we live today, yeah. where free will exists, everybody can do what they want to do. In those days, it was unusual, and the media jumped on it. So you mentioned it before, but the police's attention quickly turned to Margaret's husband, Jeffrey. Why was that? Yeah, look, I guess it was always thought that jealousy was part of this scenario. From the start, the police just said, He has to have done it. (laughs) How did he do it is the question. So they dragged him to the police station. He had no idea his wife was dead until they put a newspaper across the desk that named his wife and Dr Bogle and that they were dead. What a horrible way to find out. He was in such shock Mm. that he just froze and the police thought, oh, well, you know, he's not going to talk. You know, they tried to heavy him to admitting it, but he couldn't admit to anything because he didn't do it. He had an alibi. Mm. And he was heading towards his girlfriend's place on the other side of the city when Dr. Bogle and Mrs. Chandler arrived at the river and they interviewed her. They knocked on her door and uh, she was still asleep, invited the police in and she would burst into tears when she heard this. But she was with Jeffrey. She was his alibi. Even with that alibi, Jeffrey was you know, a big focus in the media as well. You've actually spoken to him. How does he reflect on that time and how he was treated by the police and the media? Well, he was totally upset by Mm. it all because he had an alibi. He had no reason to kill his wife. They had, I think it was a nine-month-old baby and a two-year-old. Why would he do it, you know? He could not believe that they didn't respect the fact that they had an open marriage. Police and the media could not relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. So they immediately thought it was wrong. Yeah, that's right. And jealousy was the motive. Were police certain that a third party was involved? Could this have been, you know, a double suicide or a murder suicide or anything along those lines? Yes, of course. Well, they were always looking for a murderer. Mm. But there was the question of who covered the bodies. So was there a third person? That's the stickler point. Mm. Mm. Somebody has come along, maybe not was not there at the time of the deaths, but maybe had spiked a drink and went down to see what sort of followed them and, you know, that was one suggestion. Or somebody's come along later on, noticed a man laying on the bank of the river with no pants on and noticing a woman laying on the bed of the river and she's half naked as well. And so out of maybe modesty, covered them and then went off. It was one of the great mysteries of this case. I want to bring in 
a few more suspects that popped up early in the investigation, starting with a person called Sheridan Pawsey. Why was she questioned by police? Well, the police went to the Chandler home and did a search, Mm -hmm. and they uncovered a receipt from windswept kennels. The Chandlers had dashoned dogs, Mm -hmm. and this receipt was for pills. Could these pills have been used to spike drinks as a prank or something like that? And so they knocked on her door a few days after the case broke. They interviewed her, but... The pills were new. She gave them about four pills, and really the toxicologist said, no, these are not going to kill people. Mm. But she was the first lead. She was the first one on the front page other than Bogle and Chandler. There was also a peeping Tom who came of interest called Raymond. Tell me about him. Well, the police got a telephone call from a chap who said that uh, he'd been down there, but he didn't see anything. Anyway, he rang back a few days later giving a different name. And the police thought, this is suspicious. So they dragged him in and they took him down to the river and said, well, what did you see? And he said, oh, well, I drove my car down there and I didn't see anything. You know, they thought he could have been the person who did see them and covered them. The problem was that he only had one arm and and the police (laughs) thought it was very difficult for him to cover Dr. Bogle in the way that he was covered. But there is someone that did become a more credible suspect and that is a greyhound trainer who was in the police's sights quite early on. Why was that? He had a number of greyhound dogs that he used to take out early morning down to the Lane Cove River, go down that same bush track to the golf course and slip his dogs, meaning he'd throw something out and they'd run. And it was just a way of exercising his dogs. When the police actually found him and questioned him, he said, oh, I didn't go down that track. I went down another track. The police didn't believe it. But they had no way of proving it. They were suspicious because he didn't come forward straight away. Mm. It's only when someone identified his car as being there at the track that he did come forward about three weeks later. So they really had him in the sights as being the person who covered the bodies. But with a number of dogs on leashes, he was not a person to have killed them. You know, They had no motive to kill them, but they suspected him to be the man who covered the bodies. But he never admitted that? He never admitted that. But his family was suspicious because he came home very, very anxious. They said to me, I interviewed his daughter and Mm son-in-law about that morning, and they all said that the father was a prude. He hated the sight of bare flesh. And I can understand that. That was the time. Mm. So instead of reporting these bodies, he decided, well, we think, to cover them. Well, he probably didn't know that they were dead. At that stage, oh, because see. it was just after the event would have occurred. It was around about four thirty, five o'clock in the morning that he was down that part of the river. It was almost just first light. He would not have known that they were dead at that time. Because to reiterate, there was no physical injuries on these people. No. It was only after time that their face started to turn purple mm-hmm. because the way the blood, you know, a dead body when they're laying down, the blood will pool. And Dr. Bogle was on his side. There was a little bit of blood coming out of his mouth and his nose. That's about it. So the case is still unanswered and it starts to become quite political at the time. Can you explain why that was? It was to do with the idea that there was this poison out there. Well, look, yeah, there's a killer out there. Yeah. And uh, we need to know who's done it because they may go on and kill again. And the toxicologist whose job it was to identify what killed them was not having any luck. Mm. He had the tissue samples and he was looking for all sorts of obvious poisons like strychnine, arsenic, carbon monoxide poisoning, and LSD was a suggestion. He tested for all of these drugs and couldn't come up with anything. So it became political. The leader of the opposition called on the government to put out a reward and demanded that they get other scientists involved. And so a university scientist who wanted to attract money for his students, he offered his uh, students up to do experiments, but that didn't prove anything. They found nothing as well. An inquest was held into the pair's death in May 1963, so that's you know about five months after the bodies were found. 
I want you to tell us about the evidence of sperm being found on the victims because that was kept quite secret, wasn't it? It was. It was not mentioned at any period up until the inquest and they actually closed down the inquest to the press and the public and they had a private conversation with the detectives and the forensic people. Yes, and that spermatozoa was found on Dr Bogle's coat which did suggest that there was some sort of sexual activity taking place. Now, that is an important piece of information. These two people weren't unwell when they got there. Mm, right. But there was no recognition of this in the inquest. They didn't put two and two together. Two people go down there. They're well enough to be taking off their clothes, getting involved in sex. Something happens and they can't correct their clothing. They are both going in two different directions, away from where they're laying, literally on the riverbed. They move in two different directions trying to get away from that and nobody recognised that they couldn't have been suffering up until that moment. Because you've just reminded me there was vomit as well, wasn't there? That's right. Dr Bogle vomited and they both excreted as they were moving away from that particular point. And they couldn't go very far. Dr. Bogle could only literally drag himself up off the riverbed onto the bank, which was only about a metre tall, and you could see he was dragging his feet. It was as if he was trying to escape that location. And Mrs. Chandler, she couldn't get up on the bank. She stumbled. Her knee impressions were on the mud as she moved away. She stumbled, she scratched against the mangroves, and she collapsed. So if this is such an important piece of evidence, why was it kept so secret? For puritanical purposes. <laughs> it was conservative society. Yeah, right. We don't want the word sperm on the news- in the front page of the newspaper. That was how it was. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I'm speaking with Peter Butt about the death of Dr Bogle and Mrs Chandler in Sydney in 1963. We've already touched on the idea of jealousy being something the police thought was a motive, and we know that there were extramarital affairs and open relationships in both of these marriages. Other than Jeffrey, did anyone else come of interest from those scenarios? There was a woman who was infatuated with Dr Bogle. They had had an on and off relationship, a kind of an imbalanced relationship where he was a brilliant physicist, and she was the CSIRO librarian. Mm -hmm. It was an imbalanced relationship in as much that he was the man with the power. He was never going to leave his wife for her. She was in an unhappy marriage. And he had, at the CSIRO party, had gone off with Mrs Chandler, and this woman was at that party, and she was jealous. But the police investigated her whereabouts on the night of the Chatswood party where the Bogles and the Chandlers were at, and uh, they found that she was nowhere near there. She was with her husband and another party up at Taramara, so a fair distance. So did the inquest in the end have any real conclusions? No, no conclusion whatsoever other than, well, as the police commissioner called it, the mystery of the century. This was a case that uh, could not be explained. And I think, you know, we've talked about how much media coverage there was at the time. I know you've spoken to a lot of the family members involved. How did that affect them? I think it ruined reputations. It ruined lives. Jeffrey Chandler, still when I first met him in 2004, he hadn't spoken to the media outside of writing a book. He'd given up on the media. He'd given up on everybody. His life was completely ruined. His children were affected. The children of Dr. Bogle were affected. Mrs. Bogle, she took her children back to New Zealand. They're a New Zealand family. They moved countries because of this. They moved countries, yes. Jeffrey Chandler's lover, she left and lived in Canada. And Dr. Bogle's, the woman he had an affair with, I mentioned just previously, she went off to live in London. You can't imagine how unrelenting it was. Every day in the newspaper, and there were two tabloid newspapers, The Sun and The Mirror, Mm -hmm. and they were competing for outdoing each other with a new theory, a new suspect, you know. It just went on and on and on and on. And you'd have to ask the question, how did it fail? And I think there are answers to that. If you look at the time, the period, 
the detectives who collect the evidence were called scientific detectives. The word forensics was not used. Yeah. There was no forensic team that went along and carried out the crime scene investigation, collected the evidence and analysed the evidence. These people were just ordinary coppers taken off the street, helping collect the evidence, whatever it was, condoms, candles, Mm -hmm. cardboard, whatever they found there, but they didn't analyse it. Those sort of things just ended up in a box and it was left to the toxicologist who had very limited resources to be able to deal with looking for... They did suspect a poison. It had to be a poison because there was no physical violence. So what was the poison? Well, it was up to the toxicologist and he spent 13 months, literally day and night. It was his last case. He had to give up after that, the failure of not being able to find the answer. He went through every possible poison looking for the killing agent. He spoke to experts around the world, in the FBI and in Britain, and they couldn't help him. But there was only one clue, whatever it killed one, killed the other, and at the same time. Tell me about the cone shell leak that popped up a few months after the inquest. So it would have been while this toxicologist was still trying to find out what the poison was. How did cone shells become involved? There was a scientist, a marine scientist in Brisbane, of all places, a long way away (laughs) from Sydney, who said, I think that cone shell poison could be a suspect poison in this case. And the police thought, well, we can only check it out. So They've tried they everything else. Tried everything else. <laughs> they flew to Brisbane. They walked in the door and the scientist, Dr. Endine, asked his assistant, who worked on, on the cone shell poison, he's a specialist actually, a specialist, to um, come and meet the police and talk about it. And she went, uh-oh. She was a friend of the Chandler's. No way. (laughs) Yes. And so they thought, "Uh uh-oh, we've got a suspect and we've got a poison. She used to attend with her boyfriend the Chandler's parties and her boyfriend had had an affair with Mrs. Chandler. What are the chances? What are the chances? But there they were and uh, they thought, here's our break, we've got it. Mm -hmm. So they took some cone shell poison back to Sydney, didn't match anything. So it's just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. And look, the animal has to be alive. The toxin disintegrates basically or stops being toxic after a few moments. You know, it's got to be injected from the cone shell itself. That's my understanding of it. What about the Lane Cove River? Because we mentioned at the top of the interview that it is polluted. It was polluted at the time. How did that come into the case? Well, it didn't. That's the really interesting thing. The police at the time thought, okay, let's search the river for syringes or pill bottles or whatever that might have been used. And so the divers turned up and they wouldn't go in the river. They just said, this is too polluted. We're not going in there. But that didn't click for some reason. They did come back 11 days later and found nothing, but they couldn't see anything. The river was absolutely black. There was zero visibility. So, no, they never considered the river whatsoever. You considered the river because you've been investigating this case for many years. Mm. Where did your investigation take you when it came to the river? Well, I have to go back a little bit and just say I was wanting to make a film about the case, Mm -hmm. not about solving it whatsoever. I wrote to the police asking for access to the police files I posted the letter, I came home and had a nap. (laughs) 20 minutes later, I woke up with a thought and it just popped into my brain, related to mangroves. Now, where they were laying, on the bed of the river, it was surrounded with mangroves. My schoolboy science came to my mind where we talked about mangroves giving off gases. And one of those gases is hydrogen sulfide, which is a very toxic gas. So I went off to a couple of scientists who specialise in mangroves and uh, they said, look, if a person was lying down in the cool of the morning and, you know, or they were digging in in a mangrove and people have died doing that, it's possible. But I thought, "Mm, maybe, maybe not. So I decided to do an investigation on the river itself. Six weeks later, when the police called up, I was able to tell them what I'd discovered. 
that there was this whole history of this river, a pollution history of this river, where it was emanating out of the muds hydrogen sulfide gas. And it had been doing that throughout the 1940s to such a degree that uh, the local council were going to have to evacuate the houses near the river because people couldn't breathe at night. It was ruining their paintwork on their houses. So they called in a Maritime Services Board scientist to find out what the source of the problem was. And they discovered that the river bottom itself was saturated in hydrogen sulfide gas. Now, this gas is toxic as cyanide gas. It's heavier than air, and in the cool of the morning, it hovers basically at ground level. If you were lying in that, you could die. Peter, did you solve the case? Like, had that ever been considered? It hadn't been considered. Nine years after the case broke, Mm -hmm. the police called on a scientist to go through the toxicology papers. And then he added a couple of possibles himself. One of them was hydrogen sulfide, but he said there's no evidence of hydrogen sulfide. Well, unfortunately, there weren't the resources that we have today. There was no internet. There was no cataloging of scientific reports. But fortunately, I was able to find them, and I was able to find the scientist who worked on the river, investigating the river, for hydrogen sulfide. So I came along just at the right time. He was still alive. He had his report. I was able to get the report and he gave me a brilliant interview as to what had occurred. And he just said, why didn't I think of this? As I said, he spent 13 months searching for poisons in the tissue samples and he found none. But he did find one anomaly that he'd never told anybody until I turned up at his doorstep. He told me that he found a purplish discoloration of the blood, which he couldn't explain. He went up to the scientific library, the Mitchell Library in Sydney, searching all the records, and he couldn't find anything that would explain a purple discoloration of the blood. He'd seen other discolorations of blood. Carbon monoxide poisoning turns the blood cherry red. He'd seen that before. And both of the victims had a purple discoloration of the blood. And he thought, this has to be something. But... When he was asked at the inquest whether he found anything, the question was so narrow, he didn't tell the coroner he found this. Mm. So I was the first person outside of his boss that he'd ever told about this. I knew what that purple discoloration meant because of my research into hydrogen sulfide poisoning. It is one of the symptoms of hydrogen sulfide poisoning. What did you do with this information? Well... I told the police (laughs) and um, they gave me access to, you know, all the scientific records. I found all of the witnesses that I could find, the living people, the police. I interviewed them. I made a film. And then the story just ballooned. It became bigger than a film and I wrote some books and then now a podcast series. (laughs) Did the police ever reinvestigate it though? Or is that not something they would do now? Look, It was outside their realm. Right. It was a question that they put to the head of forensic medicine in Sydney. They asked him to have a look at it. Mm. And uh, we debated it on ABC's Catalyst program. And he was sceptical, as he should be. You know, where is the evidence that this happened? It's not something that they can prove today. There were no tissue samples. There were no blood that they could test today. But over time, he used to invite me in when he had a hydrogen sulfide case. We would talk about it. And then something popped out of the woodwork about six years after my film went to air, where a retired psychologist contacted me and he had uh, some information that he wanted to pass on all of these years later. He intervened in a situation in Canberra in a park and rescued a young girl from being assaulted. And he said, what are you doing out at four o'clock in the morning? She said, I'm having nightmares from something I witnessed. Back in 1963, New Year's Day, she was at the Lane Cove River and she witnessed the two people asphyxiate, basically. And she couldn't come forward because she was down there for the same reason as other, as the Bogle and Chandler were down there. It was a lover's lane. So she didn't come forward. She didn't realise that they died. But the information that she gave 
actually beautifully dovetailed into the theory of hydrogen sulfide poisoning. So what do you think happened then, that it wasn't a murder? Well, it was misadventure. Mm. Two people in the wrong place at the wrong time. And all these years we've been looking for a killer. Yeah, well, we always look for a killer because that's the obvious thing, particularly when two people are married to other people. We always think of jealousy or, or a power imbalance or let's get rid of this person. We've seen it in recent cases. But no, it wasn't like that. Although these people were really quite normal people, except they're in an abnormal situation. They were breaking the, the mores of the conservative society. Do the families feel like this gives them some closure? Do they believe that this is what happened? Jeffrey Chandler was speechless when I really? told him the story. And he just he just said, it's the only thing that makes sense. And he was pleased. And his, I met with one of his sons, uh, the eldest son, and uh, he seemed to be appreciative that we've come up with something that at least proved that the father was the culprit, yeah. I guess. I mean, that's how I interpret his appreciation. For many years, I had hoped to speak with the Bogle family, but I wasn't successful until recent times. They contacted me and said they appreciate what I discovered and that uh, is it possible to get another inquest. So is an inquest likely, do you think? Well, we got close and I, I stuffed up basically <laughs> with this retired psychologist's statement, which I took down and I got him to sign a statutory declaration and I sent it to my friend, head of forensic medicine at the time, and he took it next door to the coroner and she said, oh, this is amazing. How about a, an inquest? Well, a month later, she retired and I missed the boat. Oh, uh, no. And a new, new coroner came in and said, oh, you've got to go through the Supreme Court and apply. And so, you know, this was all too much. You know, you've got to have lawyers. You've got mm -hmm. a, a great expense. We are still hoping. And the podcast series was the way to get all of the evidence out there, more than a film. We get all of the witnesses talking about the case. These are first-person witnesses. Most of them are now dead. But their statements are so powerful about what happened, about the characters of the people, and why murder was an absolutely ludicrous part of the story. Nobody could believe that murder had taken place. Only the police could believe that murder had taken place. The, the people who knew them didn't believe it whatsoever. And there were lots of victims in this case that didn't get the chance to hear this evidence. But I would like to have an inquest. The family would like to have an inquest. I don't care if they say, okay, it's still circumstantial, but it's the only evidence that we've got. And at least it's on public record. It's on public record. It's out there. The mm -hmm. world is listening. You know, we've had 220,000 people hear the podcast around the world. And I think to have that out there, to actually demystify the case is important, to take away all the speculation. There is no substance to the speculation. There is substance to the scientific evidence about hydrogen sulfide poisoning. Thanks to Peter for assisting us to tell this story. If you'd like to learn more about this case, we've linked his podcast and book in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Rhiannon Mooney. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know by leaving a rating or a view in your favourite podcast app. It helps other true crime fans find our content and helps us keep making the episodes you get to enjoy every week. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.